Thursday, August 17, 2023 on the calendar. Welcome our online listeners, q90fm.com slash app and online or rather on our uh, radios at 90.1 FM Green Bay Fox Cities. I'm Crash Connell and Mary Danielson. That is a handsome T-shirt you're wearing today. Well, thank you very much. Where did you get that handsome T-shirt? I got it at Red Pill Prince, and they have some great Stand Up for the Truth gear, shirts, yeah. and gear and mugs and such. Just click the gear tab at StandUpForTheTruth.com. Yes. Good morning. It is great to be here. What a privilege to serve the Lord today. Trisha Burton is my guest today. We're going to be looking at Mormonism, the fourth largest religion in the United States. I had looked into it a few times over the years, but boy, taking a fresh look at it this week, once again, showed me some very troubling details of not only its history, but of course its doctrine as well. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to get to our scripture and prayer, and then I'm going to introduce Tricia. My scripture today is 1 John 4, 1-5. to Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. Heavenly Father, we look to you today to guide and direct our steps and our conversation. We ask that by your great grace and mercy, you continue to help us contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Help us stay on the narrow path that leads to life, Lord, and keep us from deception. We lift up our guest, Trisha, today and ask for your protection on her family. Bless her with good health and refresh her in your word as only you can. Thank you for her testimony. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Trisha Burton is a fifth-generation ex-Mormon. She was the first person in her long line of devout family members, including polygamists, to become a Bible-believing Christian. Her love for apologetics and defense of the Christian faith began shortly after she was saved in the mid-1980s. She's on staff at the Brian Call Ministry, founded by the late Dave Hunt, now headed up by T.A. McMahon. She serves as a video editor and researcher. By God's providence, she was put in touch with the Berean call because of her concern about the Mormon infiltration into the body of Christ through the Mormon-produced TV series, The Chosen. Uh, in collaboration with the Berean call, Trisha and T.A. McMahon produced a series of videos exposing The Chosen. Their video, Visual Idolatry, was featured at the last conference, and you can watch that on YouTube, Visual Idolatry. In 1987, she was World Professional Pair Skating Champion, starring in the Ice Capades and various ice shows around the world. With a long career in competitive ice skating and entertainment, she transitioned to behind the scenes as a videographer and editor. Her passion to equip the body to witness to Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, she has Jehovah Witness family members as well. And her greatest joy is to see cultists come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trisha, welcome to Stand Up for the Truth. Well, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. It's wonderful to have you today. Before we get to your, uh, a portion of your testimony, I want to ask you about something that you mentioned to me last week and that you feel that apologetics, which is the defense of the faith, has really disappeared as an important priority in the church, and I couldn't agree more. Does it, does it just have a bad name, Trish? Do people resist it in general, and they don't care to do the work to defend the faith from attack? Did postmodernism kill it outright? What do you think, why do you think that we just don't hear about that anymore? Well, I think when the church began in the 80s, uh, it started to transition away from the Word of God. I noticed more entertainment started to enter in. And so if your foundation is not the Word of God, you're not, you don't know that you're, you're supposed to be a Berean mm -hmm. and to test all things and to earnestly contend for the faith. Jude 3, yeah. you know, um, earnestly contend for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. So I think there is a biblical illiteracy that has plagued the church, uh, especially today. And it's been a gradual thing, mm -hmm. you know, where the church has been slowly weaned off the Word. Now, there, and I can't broad brush that. There are pockets, praise the Lord, right. of strong Bible-believing churches that are teaching the Word. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, and I I read Seduction of Christianity in the middle by Dave Hunt in the middle of that decade, and I I did not know anything uh, like psychology or anything was infiltrating the church. I was real surprised as a young believer because I thought, well, you know, here we have this great faith delivered to us. We have the gospel. We have we have joy in the Lord. Why would anyone infiltrate the church? I didn't understand it at the time. I <laughs> I certainly do now. I mean, wow, the things mm-hmm. we're seeing in the church is just amazing. Yeah, and having come out of a cult. You know, when when you spend your life, your early days in a cult, and all it is is man's opinion, there's no teaching mm-hmm. of the Word from the Mormon pulpit. When you become a Christian and you're sitting, like I was at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa sitting under Chuck Smith, listening to the Word taught exponentially, chapter by chapter, verse by, by verse. So when the smoke starts to come under the door, when you're <laughs> having been a cultist, you immediately, the red flags go up, and you go, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah, so you have a different perspective yeah. than perhaps someone who's been raised in the church. Right, right. And like you said, they're not really teaching the Scripture anymore anyway. There's so many other things have come in, postmodernism, seeker-sensitive, and all that sort of thing have come right. in, and, and right. no one is addressing the cults. I No one is looking at any false teaching, actually. Uh, so, Trish, I, I wanted you to give us some of your testimony, because I think you probably have quite an amazing story, um, considering your biography. Could you just give us give us some, some of that testimony of how you came to know the Lord? Sure. Well, my great-great-great-grandfather was a convert to the Mormon Church in 1842. His name was Henry Grow, and I'll just call him Grandpa Grow, because <laughs> to say great-great-great over and over is... <laughs> Painstaking. Yes. So uh, Grandpa Grow uh, moved to Nauvoo from Pennsylvania. He was the superintendent of bridge building in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. So uh, when he became a Mormon, he moved to Nauvoo and worked on the Nauvoo Temple. And um, this was when Joseph Smith came out with his revelation on polygamy. And so Grandpa Grow was a polygamist. He had seven wives and 30 children. And after the death of Joseph Smith, which the Mormon Church says he was martyred, but he wasn't martyred. Martyrs don't go out in a blazing gun battle Mm -hmm. killing two people on their way out, Mm -hmm. which is what Joseph Smith did. But after Joseph Smith's death, Grandpa went across the plains to the Great Salt Lake Basin with Brigham Young and uh, 70,000 people went across the plains from Nauvoo, and uh, it was a 1,300-mile trek, but they settled in the Salt Lake Basin, and Brigham Young called upon my grandpa to build the Tabernacle Building. So my grandpa was the architect and builder of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, you know, the dome building that's uh, 150 feet across and 250 feet long, and it's considered an architectural landmark. Um, It's been awarded historical landmark because of the wood lattice roof. They didn't have steel mills in Salt Lake back then. And so Grandpa employed his bridge building skills to uh, its elliptical wooden trusses that were held together with wooden dowels and uh, rawhide. So that's our claim to fame. I claim to flame. (laughs) Sorry, Freudian slip claim to fame as um, LDS, and my relatives, you know, they would put their their kind of their fingers under the suspenders. Oh, Grandpa was, you know, the architect of the tabernacle building. And now, to me, it's just, it's heartbreaking mm-hmm. that that's where my family came from, and that's where they worship their false god. Mm-hmm. And then I have another relative who was Joseph Smith's bodyguard, um, he was a great great uncle, which probably kept him pretty pretty busy, considering all the trouble that Joseph Smith. You know, Joseph Smith was run out of Ohio. Um, he was tarred and feathered, and it was because of the polygamy issue. He was taking other people's wives, things like that. So that is where I came from. And excuse me, when I when I was eight years old, now my father moved out of Utah and moved to California, so he's kind of out of the Mormon bubble. Mm. And when I was eight years old, uh, I became an early reader. My mom taught me to read at a very young age, and so at eight years old in the Mormon church, 
a child is baptized into the church. And the Mormons teach that everyone is born without a sin nature, that you are born innocent. But at eight, you reach what's called the age of accountability, and you are baptized in the Mor- into the Mormon church. But the Mormon God at eight years old brings out the scales of justice, opens the ledger, and now you are accountable. He's, he's marking your sin. So I, ha- I remember even as a child having trepidation for my, my, eighth, you know, my eighth birthday, thinking, oh, no, I'm in, you know, now the clock's ticking. Hmm. But I was baptized into the church, and um, at 10 years old, I started ice skating. Uh, My mom put me in ice skating, and I was behind from all the 10-year-old girls, and this will tie into my testimony. Um, So I was put in the fast track to catch up. So by the time I was 12 years old, I was caught up. So I was on the ice for four hours before school. It was just like boot camp, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of like, whoa, Um, and five hours after school. But by 12, 12 years old, I was caught up, and during this time, um, at eight, when I was baptized at eight years old, the Mormons gave me a Bible. You're gifted a Bible. Now, you don't have a Bible in your home. I don't ever remember opening the Bible. I think we had one, but I don't remember reading it. You have a Book of Mormon in your crib, I mean, from the time you're born. Wow. There's the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. Now, the Mormons have what's called four standard works. So Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, and then the Bible. And if you ask them, okay, which one is the most important, they will say the Book of Mormon. Um, And the Bible is at the bottom of the totem pole because they believe the Bible insofar as it's correctly translated. And what that means is wherever it doesn't agree with Mormonism, it's not translated correctly. Mm. So they believe the Bible has been corrupted. Um, But at eight years old... um, I received my Bible, and I took it home. Now, they wanted me to keep it at the church, They wanted, which is a whole other issue. But I pitched a fit, and my primary teacher, which is like your Wednesday— oh, it, for Christians, it would be like your Awana teacher for the kids okay, yep. on Wednesdays. My, my primary teacher let me take it home, and I started reading it. You know, and you start at the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, you know. <laughs> So by the time I was 10 years old, I would cross up in the index. I was up to Ephesians, which is very, I don't know any 10-year-olds that do that, but I was just a bookworm, you know, the little kid, the geek. Yeah, right. And and this is where God began to plant his word in my heart. I'll just cry because of the power of the Word of God. If you're just an encouragement to my brothers and sisters out there, if you're witnessing to Mormons or those in the cult, give them the Word. It is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. It penetrates. Mm -hmm. And so Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35, were the scriptures that the Lord planted in my heart. And it's Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel shall save it. And it it just was a wrench in my gears. I, I thought, well, wait a minute, you're supposed to lose your life for Jesus? There's some kind of surrender? Wait a minute, we're, I'm a God in embryo, because the Mormons prime the pump from the time you're a small child that you are a god in embryo and you need to gain exaltation. Wow. And so it just didn't fit what I was reading in the Gospels. Um, so I kept asking my, my dad, my dad especially, we would have these powwows, and I would ask him questions about Mormon doctrine. So I would say by the time I was 13, 14, I'd under, I understood very well Mormon doctrine. My mom taught primary, and daddy was in the bishopric. And so at 13 years old, and this this was my, you are told from the time you're a little kid as a Mormon that you need to gain what's called a testimony, or a burning in the bosom that the church is true. So Mormon children are looking for an experience with what they call the Holy Ghost. Now, it's not the Holy Ghost. It's a ghost, but it's not the Holy Ghost. And so at 13, 
it's kind of it was move up day where you move from the little kids church the primary to what's called MIA which was the young ladies uh you're becoming an adult it's kind of your coming out and so they had a service in the LDS church and um I was standing right outside the sanctuary um, and waiting for the doors to open. And I was so excited. You know, I'm graduating. I'm going to be a woman now. And they opened the doors. And the ladies in the church, in the Relief Society, they had decorated the sanctuary. Now, the Mormon sanctuary doesn't have any windows. And the services are three hours long. Talk about boring. (laughs) Um, But. This was an exciting day, and the ladies had decorated the sanctuary with flowers. It looked like a wedding. So I was so excited, first in line, standing there. They opened the doors. The organ music starts playing, and there it was. I had my experience. It was a feeling of euphoria. There was a bright light above me, and there was a voice in my head. It wasn't audible, but it was it, it was strong, and it was powerful. And it was that the Mormon Church is true, the Book of Mormon is true, Joseph Smith. I just stood there Hmm. in awe, thinking it was the Holy Spirit. Um, The Book of Mormon is true, Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, and that if I was faithful, I would one day have my own planet and be a goddess, um, just like all the other gods. And from that moment on, I had my testimony. You could not shake it. The Book of Mormon. Now, I know today that was demonic. Mm, wow. Because the doctrines that Mormons believe are doctrines of demons. And it started with the head demon. You shall be as gods, Genesis chapter 3. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but never underestimate when a Mormon is telling you, but I felt the Holy Ghost. I had a burning in my bosom. Now, that comes from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 9, where it talks about a burning in your bosom. But my testimony was solidified. And so what happened, I I continued in skating, and you're on this path of perfection. So in every area of my life, because the Mormons teach that you can attain perfection, so whether it was in skating, academics, or in the church, you are crossing your T's, and the pressure is enormous. Um, So at 16 years old, I was sent away to train in Colorado Springs. My coach moved there, and we were training at the Olympic Training Center there. And so now I'm away from family supervision from my parents. I'm just coaches. And I started to flex my muscles a little bit. You start to rebel rebel under all that pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I, I qualified for nationals. I went to nationals, and I completely bombed. I was 10th place with my skating partner. By then, they had put me into pair skating. So I was in two events, junior ladies and uh, pair skating. And I, um, I bombed at nationals. I was 10th with my, in pairs, and I was devastated. I had had an injury, a horrible foot injury, and I just wasn't ready. So it was a deer in the headlights. I bombed. I, you know, I'd come home licking my wounds, and I was, I believe I was about 17, 16, 17. And, but the, the judges went to my parents and my coaches and they said, look, we know she's a prodigy. We have her in line. It's very political. And um, tell her to keep going. We're going to send her to, to Japan on an international competition. So back on the horse I go and back to Colorado to train. And I just, what's the word, broke mm-hmm. under the pressure. Wow. And when I turned 18, I called my mom, much to her angst, and I said, Mom, I'm quitting skating. I'm not doing this anymore. You're all crazy. (laughs) All these diets and all this pressure. So I quit skating, moved back home to California, and this created a lot of tension in my family because now I'm starting to rebel against everything and uh, even the Mormon uh, things. Now, I had guilt in my heart. The Mormons, you're always on a guilt trip because you never measure up. So um, because of the tension, I moved out, and um, I was living in my car. So you go from the heights of, you know, costumes and skating to living in my car. But I was going to show the world that, you know, I I don't need any of this, 
and um, I was living in my car, showering at the gym, and working as a hostess in a restaurant, and uh, sleeping on friends' couches, you know, kind of out in the wilderness for about two or three years, and a gal at the restaurant uh, saw my junk in the car, and she said, Trish, are you okay? And I thought, you know, I did have a breaking point. You're supposed to be so tough in skating and keep a stip, you know, no crying unless you're bleeding. And um, I broke down crying. And she said, Trish, you can move in with me, but, uh, and pay me whatever you can, but you have to just put up with my roommate. And she called her the dreaded roommate. And at the time, I didn't even care. I was just like, whatever. (laughs) So I just wanted a place to sleep. So I move in. And the roommate was a born again Christian. She was on the worship uh, team at Calvary Chapel Downey. Wow. And she was a big gal. She was about six foot two, just big bones. And, um, and I'm tiny. I'm, I'm four feet 11 <laughs> and about 90 pounds. And so this was like Mutt and Jeff, and she lit into me with the gospel. And I started giving her my Mormon, you know, well, I have the truth. We're the only ones with the truth. And we have the restoration and the fullness of the gospel. And and so this went on for about six months. And she kept giving me scriptures. And in the morning, she would, I thought she was crazy. Because I come from like a very stiff Mormon tabernacle genre of singing hymns. And, you know, and here she was praising the Lord early in the morning. And I'm thinking, this gal's nuts. Okay, she's nuts. And but I liked the music, so I was singing under my breath <laughs> and um, praising Jesus. And I was like, "Wow, this is all about Jesus." One day, she opens up the Word and she starts talking to me about being born again. And I said, "Well, that's I've been baptized because that's what Mormons think it means being born again." And she said, "No, Trish, you need a completely new nature." You are dead in your sin. I mean, she didn't mince words. So this went on for probably seven, eight months. And one night, I got home really late, two, three in the morning, because I was just a wild child. And she'd had enough. And she said to me, I'll never forget it. She was up, and she said, Trisha Burton, you are not going to become a god. You are going to fry like bacon. Oh, my gosh. And most Christians would probably say, oh, that's so, that's so unloving. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I can't believe she said that. No, that was exactly what a stiff-necked little Mormon Pharisee living in sin needed. Mm. Um, The word, you know, Jeremiah 23, verse 29 says, is not my word like a fire, like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. And sometimes God will use an Ezekiel or a Jeremiah yep. to say it like it is. Yep. And so I went sniveling into the bedroom <laughs> and I didn't want to let her know that mm-hmm. that really had an effect on me. I was afraid of hell. No matter what a Mormon's telling you, that they have the truth and they have the Lord and they know Je- No, they don't. God is not in the business of giving the Holy Spirit to people who think they're going to become a God. Yeah. And yeah. so a couple days later, I went sniveling out, you know, I didn't stay in the bedroom the whole time, but sniveling up to her, and I said, you know, I, I need Jesus. I need, um, hmm. I need to be born again. So we prayed. I'll never forget that she said, well, sit down, and we prayed, and I repented of my sins and said, Lord, I surrender to you, not to a church. Um, and I had a very powerful experience. Now, I'm not into experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, but my, my conversion, my testimony was based on the Word of God. Now I'm doing what the Word of God says. I'm coming to Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. Right. And I had been reading the Bible during this time. And so um, I don't really talk about it. You'd think I was ready for a straitjacket if I gave you all the details <laughs> of what happened. But I knew that I had met the Lord in this huge weight of sin. Because the Mormons have a doctrine, the ho- they have a horrible doctrine about sin. But basically what it is, is that you can attain perfection. So let's say if you were an alcoholic, let's say, and you were sober for three years, and then you fell off the wagon, you went out and got hammered, 
you know, one night, then what they teach is that all your past sins, you know, er, you have to hit the, the uh, you stop button and go back to square one, and all your past sins are added to your account. And that's in Mormon uh, scripture, Doctrine and Covenants, section 82, verse 7, where it says, And now verily I, the Lord, will not lay any sin to your charge. Go your ways and sin no more, but unto that soul who sinneth shall the former sins return. Mm. And, and so if this doesn't break your heart for the Mormon people, they are under a heavy, heavy burden. Yes, indeed. Wow, Trisha, and, what an amazing what an amazing yeah. testimony that is. We're talking to Trisha Burton, um, thebereancall.org. And if you want resources on this, the Berean Call has tremendous resources, and especially one that I've been looking at. It's, it's a Berean Bite, they call it, and it's the Mormonism mm-hmm. set. And it's a, a booklet, a study guide, and a CD, an hour long, a little over an hour CD. And it has tremendous amount of information on who Joseph Smith was. I mean, he was just a teen when he decided, you know, when this angel appeared to him, told him there were some golden plates, they were written in an Egyptian language, and it became the Book of Mormon, and that he was to restore the true gospel because it was corrupt at that time. And I don't know, that's he's got an overactive imagination as far as I'm concerned. He was very young. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, wow, Tricia, that's just fantastic. I guess I want to get to, um, in the next half, because we're, we're winding down this particular segment already. It goes so fast. But I want to talk about The Chosen, and I want to open up the next, uh, the next part of the podcast with The Chosen, because Mormonism teaches, like you said, God had a, has a physical body. He lives on a planet. Um, he's, mm-hmm. He is but one of an infinite number of gods ruling over his own world, um, untold numbers of goddess wives, I'm taking this uh, from the Berean Bite, uh, who produce millions of spirit children. These spiritual off- offspring of God and his goddesses must be birthed through physical beings, non-gods on earth. This obtains for them the physical bodies necessary to become gods and goddesses who then create and rule over their own worlds. And so this is why polygamy was such a big part of Mormonism. Um, it produced bodies for the spirit babies. Oh, Trisha, I mean... When we talk about the chosen and we talk about who's producing it, and a lot of people don't believe this or they deny it, who's producing it and who's distributing it, when you realize that it's it's become an ecumenical soup, and that's the end game here, but when you realize mm-hmm. what, the, what the doctrine is, and then you go back and look at that, and you look at the people and, and the quotes by Dallas Jenkins, who's the creator of the chosen, you really start to wonder, and we're going to talk about this in the next part, why people are so emotionally invested with the chosen. Here's, here's the chosen by the numbers before we go to the break here. 19,000 investors, $10 million donated by people to have the chosen made, 100 million viewers, and the goal is to reach a billion by 2027. That is just amazing. So, um, Trish, we only have a minute. Um, any, any way you want to tease this next segment? Well, I believe it's one of Satan's greatest tools at the moment Mm -hmm. that he's using to bring about ecumenicism. Yes. And this is part of the one world religion that's coming. Yes, absolutely. Where everyone unites. So you have Jonathan Rumi, the Mormon Jesus. I mean, you know, not the Mormon Jesus, but the Jesus of the Chosen, who Mm -hmm. is a Catholic evangelist uh, with a hollow app. And then you have the Mormon producers. And it's all kumbaya. Yeah, definitely. Trisha Burton, we're going to come back and talk about all that in the next segment, thebereancall.org. And you can also watch a visual idolatry on YouTube. More with Trisha Burton after these sponsors. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth. My name is Mary Danielson. We're talking to Trish Burton. Trish is with thebereancall.org, and she, the first half we had this uh, great testimony of hers and uh, just the life that she was in uh, in Mormonism. Very, very interesting. Um, like I said, thebereancall.org has a lot of different resources on all of this. And so we want to just jump right in here. Um, the Chosen, I had mentioned the numbers beforehand. This has just taken the world by storm. I understand it's going to be on the networks coming up. 
It is basically a visual representation or translation of the scriptures by default. Is that correct, Trish? Yes, that's what they claim. Now, I mean, talk about the phenomenon. It's uh, in the top five on Amazon Prime right now. Wow. So it's sweeping the world, and they are translating it, um, not just translating it with subtitles, but they are dubbing it with language. Wow. Um, yes. In, into over a hundred languages, um, but um, you know, I the first time I ever saw an episode because there were some gals at my church raving about it, and I thought, okay, whenever there's a group of people raving about them, uh oh, I mean, mm-hmm. my red flag just goes up. So I went home and I thought, well, you know, if I jump into it, I'll just jump into episode season one episode six i'll just watch that and that is the episode where jesus says to nicodemus they're having a conversation um and he says nicodemus is struggling to believe in jesus and and the chosen jesus says what does your heart tell you and i the red you know springs were coming out of my head i think <laughs> that's mormonism mm. You know, because that's what we're primed to do is to follow our heart, get it burning in your bosom. And, of course, the Bible says the heart is um, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. So that's what precipitated my research. And the further I dug, I went, it it was, it's produced by Mormons. Daryl Eves and Brad Pello are hardcore temple-going Mormons. And then... The Harmon brothers were distributing it, and they are also Mormons, temple-going Mormons. So Dallas Jenkins said in an interview, uh, we are producing 56 episodes, and most of it isn't from the Bible. And then he went on to say 95% of the chosen isn't from the Bible. So, well, then where is it from? It's from the imagination of mm-hmm. the screenwriters of Dallas Jenkins, Ryan Swanson, and Tyler Thompson. And so this Jesus, and Dallas Jenkins says, we're not adding to the Bible. He continually does that tap dance. He says we're at its backstory. Um, but they are, no matter how you slice it, they are in adding to the Word of God, mm-hmm. which is... God absolutely pr- prohibits. They're just using using a visual medium. And one of the problems with movie imagery is the powerful and lasting effect, effect it has on the viewer's mind. Right. If if it's a lie, that lie can become entrenched in the viewer's mind. Hmm. And wow. so 2 Corinthians 10 Uh, Verses 4 and 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So they are using their own imaginations, the screenwriters, and it's a false Jesus. I mean, there's no other way to slice it. It is not biblical, and it it is adding to the Word of God, which is absolutely yeah. prohibited. Wow. Trish, tell it, because I have a, um, a quote here from Dallas Jenkins. He said, I said that many LDS folks and I love the same Jesus. I still yeah. believe that. It's gotten me in a lot of trouble, but I still believe that. So, Trish, who who is the Jesus of Mormonism? Oh, goodness. How much time do you have? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the Jesus of Mormonism is a created, he's a created being. First of all, he's not the God of the Bible from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. Psalm 90, verse two. He's the spirit. The Mormon Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, who became the devil. He's the offspring of sexual relations between a mother God and a father God in the preexistence. Now, we all had a mommy God. Uh, Mm. Well, father God had a lot of wives, apparently, according to Brigham Young. And so Jesus was the firstborn spirit child of Heavenly Mother and Heavenly Father. And then Jesus' physical birth, the virgin birth, is not the virgin birth. Heavenly Father, who the Mormons say is Elohim now, but Brigham Young said it was Adam God, but their God is terribly confused. Mm -hmm. But Elohim, who has a resurrected, glorified body, 
a physical body of flesh and bones as tangible as man, came down and had sexual relations with the Virgin Mary, which, go figure, then she wouldn't be a virgin anymore, Mm. but to produce the child Jesus. Uh, The Mormon Jesus was married to the Marys and Martha. Um, He did not create all things. He did not. uh, He atoned for our sins in the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, so there, you know, if you had a hundred dollar bill, how many points would have to be wrong before you knew it was a counterfeit? Yeah. Just just one. Yeah. Right. Wow. Wow. One. Yeah. And, And so that obviously what what would Christians have to do with being yoked? The the emotionalism involved, you know, it's like I I don't even know where to start with some of this because I don't understand if you know this, you're responsible for this information. If you know that the God of of these uh, producers and directors and the people that distribute Angel Studios, if their God is Mormonism, I'm vexed by this, Trish. I'm scratching my head because I don't understand why Mm. Christians aren't rejecting this. And and it talks about, people say in in your... um, visual idolatry, people are picturing the Jesus in the chosen and Peter when they read the Bible and when they pray. And so they're saying, well, watch the chosen and it'll be a witnessing tool. Well, how in the world can it be a witnessing tool? If you're going to watch that first and then open up your Bible, because now you're curious about the Bible now, because Satan's the author, author of confusion, what a disaster is that, right? I mean, how can this possibly be a witnessing tool? Right. Well, and a lot of people have asked me, how can this be? How can Dallas Jenkins be unequally yoked with the Mormons? Mm -hmm. What they don't realize is that Mormons are especially seasoned Mormons. Now, Daryl Eves and Brad Pillow, they were Mormon bishops. And Brad Pillow was a a stake uh, in the stake first presidency. So they know what mm. they know Mormon theology, but they very cleverly they use our language, but they have a completely different definition. So I I am a hundred percent convinced that when Daryl Eves and Brad Pillow and the Harmon brothers talk to Dallas Jenkins, they are not giving him the meat mm. of what they really believe. Hmm. And so, uh, but Dallas Jenkins is accountable. He's run right. through so many roadblocks in Scripture. But the issue is is that the visual idolatry, the images as well, who is this Jesus? And it is a false Christ. And what you have now is Christians, when they're reading their Bible, I can't tell you how many people I've heard say, I hear Matthew's voice, the Matthew of the chosen, when hmm. I'm reading Matthew when I'm reading the narrative, or that, oh, now I understand what Peter looks like, yeah. you know, wow. and so very, very dangerous. When you get into the realm of visualization, and you are hearing a voice from the characters in The Chosen, and you have Levi Lesko um, and his wife, you know, his wife, they have uh, 12 churches in Montana, but his wife has been all over YouTube saying, you know, saying that when she has her devotional time. She pictures Jonathan Rumi, the Jesus of the Chosen, and she has conversations wow. with him. And so this is in the realm of spiritism. Um, it's opening the door to the occult. Wow, that's incredible. And the way they flesh out these characters, and they, they treat these characters so lightly, it's almost it's cringeworthy because now Matthew was autistic. Matthew Was it Matthew who helped... Jesus prepare a sermon and that's just right. that's just the tip of the iceberg on how they're these are real people okay you cannot portray real people based on the imaginations of movie makers it's a it's going to be it has to be a misrepresentation because words have meaning and Jesus is the word made flesh so this is such an epic fail uh, Trish and I, I just don't understand how how this is happening is is um, Jerry Jerry Jenkins from the left behind series is that Dallas Jenkins father Yes, and he's completely on board with The Chosen. Uh, he writes books promoting The Chosen. So, wow. yes, he's completely behind this. But, you know, in Season 2, Episode 8, which to me is just one of the most abhorrent things, you have right in the introduction, you know how when you, you click on The Chosen app, there'll be a little description about, about what that episode is about. Mm-hmm. And it says... Um, 
while Jesus and Matthew prepare the content for the big sermon, the disciples spread the word and fighting among themselves. So they have them actually going on record saying Jesus and Matthew are preparing, uh, preparing the content for the Sermon on the Mount. And it's, it's unbelievable when you watch this. And that's where you go, wait a minute. Wow. You know, is this the word of God? Matthew 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So you have a completely different Jesus. I mean, it's just blasphemy. Wow. It's pure blasphemy. Tricia, when the first half of the podcast, towards the end, I mentioned some of the teachings of Mormonism. And of course, as you and I both know, it takes a long time to delve deeply um, into their history and all the crazy stuff about um you know, the Israelites coming to this country, supposedly, and, and uh, the Native Americans, and I don't know if we'll ever have time for that, but it's you can catch all that in the uh, Berean Bite, the Mormonism set uh, that's in there in great detail, and I highly recommend. Also, Lighthouse Trails has um, a, yeah. a tract, a booklet on the Chosen. I highly recommend that resource, too. Now, you had said to me a few days ago about how they're, at this time, also changing and have been changing, just like mm-hmm. Joseph Smith did, a lot of the doctrines to make them more palatable because every time you turn around, well, they're just Christians like everyone else. Can you tell us some of the ways that, that they are changing these doctrines to just appeal to a, an ecumenical uh, church? Oh, goodness. Well, you have, um, this started with um, Hink, Gordon B. Hinckley. He was the uh, 15th prophet of the Mormon church, and he was a PR man. Hmm. So the Mormons, in the early days, it was gloved off with Joseph Smith's first vision. You know, all the Christian churches are wrong, all their creeds are an abomination, and all their professors, all their ministers are corrupt. So with one swoop of the pen, Joseph Smith wipes out the Christian church, wow. right? All are wrong. Mm-hmm. But now what you have is... Um, just recently, in 2018, you have the current prophet, Russell M. Nelson, who dropped the name Mormon. He said that God was offended. That at, you know, He said this at conference, and twice a year Mormons have conference. It's in April and October, and it's, the gavel goes down. This is God speaking through the prophet. And so apparently God contacted Russell M. Nelson and said, you know, Russell, I'm offended that you are called Mormon. And um, so drop the name. Hmm. And uh, so this is part of their PR push to look like Christians. And they they just completely scrub the name Mormon on the Internet. I mean, on YouTube, they had a whole channel called I Am a Mormon. And now it's called Coming to Christ. Hmm. And so they completely changed it. And they are infiltrating uh, Bible studies. They, are, they look like a Christian group on Facebook and, and the Internet, uh, very subtle, very dangerous. It's, it's the old adage, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. Well, yeah. Are they are they downplaying some of this? Uh, it, it, Trish, it's like sci-fi, you know, that God lives on a planet near a star called mm-hmm. Cole. I mean, it really sounds like sci-fi. Are they downplaying the golden plates and the Moroni and all that, or, or are they keeping that history um, like I said, the record of two migrations of ancient people to the Americans mm-hmm. is it? Are they kind of pushing that on the back burner? Well, they are not denying anything in the Book of Mormon. Okay. So, but here's the issue: when when a, when they give you the Book of Mormon, if you're not biblically grounded, it sounds Christian. Hmm. Um, it it ha- it speaks about the Trinity. Um, it it talks about only one God. So all the the bizarre doctrines of Mormonism are not found in the Book of Mormon, but that's the hook. Okay. That's how they hook you into the church, because it sounds so Christian. Now, in First Nephi chapter 13, it trashes the Bible. It says uh, many plain and precious parts have been removed from the Bible. So it says it five different times, by the great and abominable church, which is the mother of abominations. And that would be us, Christians take a bow in the Christian church, um, so they undermine the Word of God and subtly supplant it with the Book of Mormon, which is the quote-unquote fullness of the everlasting gospel. But today, they are, you know, I, I call Mormonism, because of the way it changes all the time, 
if you're dealing with it or you're trying to witness the Mormons, it's like running an obstacle course with a block of jello. <laughs> it's continually changing and mm-hmm. disintegrating, and, and um, Mormonism wears a mask. And so today, they are on record on their website saying, we don't believe that you can get your own planet anymore. And I'm like, you got to be kidding. Wow. That's what we all were striving for as Mormons. And a lot of the newer Mormons, I was in the church when the racist doctrines were in place, when the blacks were cursed by God. And this was a doctrine. Okay, this came from God. Mm-hmm. And so polygamy, now I wasn't in the church when polygamy was practiced, but polygamy in Doctrine and Covenant section 132 is a new and everlasting covenant. And uh, Brigham Young said the only way that men can become gods, even the sons of God, is to enter into polygamy. So they're suppressing their really crazy doctrines and putting on a Christian face now. And, And what's sad is the younger generation, the Gen Zs and the millennials in Mormonism, I was in Utah about four or five years ago, witnessing, and many of the young Mormons, you you almost have, you have to get them lost before you get them saved. They didn't even know their own doctrine because of the church hiding it. Yeah. Well, and and, and I know that doctrine doesn't really matter to them, and it is a contradictory uh, belief system as it is, because God was man, um, you know, and then, but it says God would be unchangeable. And is, is this part of why they put so much uh, emphasis on feelings and the burning in the bosom, something called uh, double think or something like that, because they really, they really don't want you to understand a systematic theology like you would find in Christianity, right? Right, right. And, you know, it, if Satan can get you into the realm of mysticism and emotions, mm-hmm. you know, where you just put your finger in the air and whichever way the wind blows, that's truth. And Mormon, you're conditioned, you're brainwashed from the time you are a child that you need that experience with the Holy Ghost. So I, I just watched a debate with Mormon apologists, and they, they are literally saying, um, you know, regardless of the, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing, regardless of the problem in the Mormon doctrine, uh, rely on your testimony. Hmm. which, you know, and they are still beating that drum. So, and and here's the, you know, I believe the Lord in his sovereignty allowed me to have that powerful experience in the yeah. Mormon church. He knew right. I was going to get, you know, but it, it's so I can understand and have compassion on it. These experiences are powerful. Mm-hmm. And that's where the chosen also, you know, that's why when I see people so emotionally attack, attached to the chosen, it's very dangerous. Yeah. But yeah. but our God, the Word of God, can break through. And that's the beauty, is we have the weapons. We have the Word of God, and it is powerful. It opens eyes. God saves cultists. He saves Mormons. Mm-hmm. He saves Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm-hmm. He can reach into the deepest, darkest pit and save a cultist. And it's, it's, our God is still working, still saving. Yes, yes. And he loves every one of those people, and he died for those people. Um, right. We just have, eh, we have about six minutes left, Tricia. And I, what's fascinating to me is how America fits in with this, because there were uh, a, a record, the Book of Mormon claims to be a record of two migrations of people to the Americas. And the second one I find the most interesting, the first one took place uh, at the time of the Tower of Babel. The second one um, claimed that Israelites left Jerusalem about 600 B.C. And um, this, the book, the um, Berean Bight, uh, from the Breen Call, talks about this a little bit, and that the people that um, came to America became the ancestors of Native Americans. And I know uh, someone like Glenn Beck, who is a Mormon, and mm-hmm. um, has very influential because he mixes conservatism with it, and people then grab onto the conservatism and they ignore the Mormonism. And I've heard him say that that even our Constitution is a wholly inspired document. So really, Trish, there's a lot of connection here between this country, of course, because this is where they traveled, this is where they tried to set up uh, their religion. Uh, what what should people know about the Mormon view of America specifically as, as a... Um, I don't know, something that is special by God because of Mormonism. Well, I I was taught as a Mormon, as a child, that one day 
the Mormon, I mean, this is a little bit of a sidebar, but that the United States government would hang by a thread and that the LDS church, we Mormons, when I was a Mormon, we would rescue the United States. And so Mormons are heavily infiltrated into the IRS, the CIA. Um, they're, they're very good at masking what they really believe. Um, you, you know, you have Tim Ballard in um, The Sound of Freedom. He's a Mormon. The story is about him. He's a Mormon. And, um, you know, and I'm all for rescuing children in child trafficking. But you have to stand back and go, wow, what is going on spiritually? And it is the Mormons with a, with a very powerful platform. I mean, when you're sitting on, the estimates are $157 billion mm-hmm. the church has accumulated. Wow. Um, that's power mm-hmm. in PR and um, in all, all spheres. So. Yes, and when you listen to Glenn Beck, he very much sounds like a Christian. Um, I used to watch him all the time, you know, when he was on Fox and that sort of thing, because he's very sharp and he had a lot of insights into uh, current events and that sort of thing. Uh, But then when I realized uh, what was going on with that, I just thought, well, you know, I kind of pulled back back a little bit because now he's talking about um, a national repentance. He's talking about revival. And I went, wait a minute, revival into what? Um, That's what he was all about was and also bringing the pulpits back to where they should be. Is this somehow connected with that restoration? I mean, I know this is are many centuries apart here, but that restoration uh, that Mormon is teaching, Mormonism teaches, um, still working on it through someone like Glenn Beck, perhaps. Oh yes, most definitely. And they, the Mormons, I mean, they're bold. They're stepping up, taking these platforms, and acting. I mean, like a Christian pastor. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it it brings a lot of confusion. But if you take off the mask. I mean, they're still wearing their temple garments. You know, if you get into the temple ceremony, it's, I call it uh, masonry, reheated masonry. Hmm. Only when you leave, you know, you get souvenirs and you're wearing your Mormon undergarments and they have learned secret handshakes and passwords. It's very occultic Hmm. to uh, one day pass through the veil where they can become a god. So you have to strip it down and ask very pointed questions. Yes, and wow, there's so much we could do, Trish. And I, we're talking to Trish Burton, the briancall.org, a lot of great resources there, and also Visual Idolatry. You can find that on YouTube, and I really uh, encourage people to watch that if you have any questions at all about The Chosen. And Trish, I know this is a big subject, and I want to just give you the last two minutes. Is there anything we missed? Is there anything you want to really impress on the listener about The Chosen or about Mormonism? I don't want to put you on the spot, but in two minutes. Uh, anything that we missed, do you think, today? Well, if it if I could just say anything to your listeners, I know there's pretty probably pretty strong Christians listening. Mm-hmm. Is um, there are sixteen? These are the numbers. There are sixteen point five million Mormons. That's their number. Okay. And there's eight point seven million Jehovah's Witnesses. Countless Catholics. I I don't even know the numbers. Yeah. And then you have the chosen, which is their goal is to reach a billion people with this false. Uh, image of who Jesus is. And so we are to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. I mean, there's so many fronts that we're fighting. Mm -hmm. And Christians, we have the answers. Be encouraged. Go to the Lord and ask Him to give you the opportunities to reach these dear people. I mean, they, they are deceived by false prophets and false teachers, and that's a heartbreaker and the time is short the devil's pulling out all the stops mm-hmm. he knows his time is short and his goal the end game is to unite everybody in mm-hmm. a one world religion so mm-hmm. we're seeing this and um but be strong in the lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and so i just want to say god bless you my brothers and sisters and um to all those on the front lines, I just uh, there's another guy, uh, Bill McKeever, just a plug for Bill McKeever. Okay. He's in Utah on the front lines, and uh, he has a ministry to the Mormons. Okay. It's called Mormonism Research Ministry, uh, Mormonism Research Ministry, MRM.org, and it's a go-to okay. resource. Okay. 
Great, great. Trisha, we got to wrap it up. We probably could have gone another hour. So grateful for you. We're going to be praying for you for boldness and for protection and all those things. And and uh, everybody, just uh, watch um, watch her video on uh, Visual Idolatry on YouTube. Thank you for joining us today. We have Jeff Wiegand tomorrow. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord.